have landed in the golden state of California to proceed with our interviews at Stanford and Berkeley. We are heading to meet Professor Matthew Jackson at the Economics Department at Stanford University. He is the recipient of the 2015 John von Neumann Award of Rye College. Uh, my name is Matthew Jackson. I'm a professor of economics by training. I work on social and economic networks, so I study how patterns of behavior and interaction affect human behavior. Professor Jackson explained why and how these patterns affect education and the labor market and inequalities, as well as how to get into network science. Uh, well, I, you know, I think deep down we know a lot about these things, but we don't always keep awareness of them. So, for instance, you know, I, I always think of, of networks affecting three main things, um, our opinions, our opportunities, and our behaviors. So, you know, the, the fact that we're constantly being influenced by other people in terms of our opinions, you know, it's, it, what, what information we're hearing about, um, you know, whether there's uh, global warming, whether there's climate change, these kinds of things. Uh, you know, w information's constantly coming in. It's coming in from people we trust. It's coming in from people we don't trust. And that's constantly influencing us. And, and uh, I think whether or not we're aware of how biased the set of individuals we're listening to is and, and the sources of information we're getting, we're not always aware of, of how that's influencing us. And so there was a study that was done by the U.S. government called the Moving to Opportunity Study. It was mm -hmm. done in the 1990s. And what they did is they gave, you know, they, they had families um, that were poor families relative in the bottom uh, fifth of the income distribution in the United States. And they broke them into three different groups. So they had several thousand families. Some of them they did nothing to. Some of them, they gave vouchers that allowed them to pay for, for their housing. And then others, they gave vouchers that allowed them to pay for their housings, but only if they moved to different neighborhoods. And in particular, they had to move out of the poor neighborhood they were living in and into a wealthier neighborhood. So this is really an experiment of, you know, how does your social environment actually affect y your lifetime? And, and one estimate is if you take an eight-year-old and move them out, if you look at their lifetime earnings difference, you get a, a, an added earnings of about $300,000 over their lifetime just from moving them from the poor neighborhood to the wealthier neighborhood. Um, so, so it's a huge difference that it, it makes. And, and that's something that's easy to, you know, to underestimate sort of how important these um, social factors are. But that's sort of one measure of, of you know, how it mattered. And it also it's interesting that when they look at 18-year-olds that were moved, there was almost no effect. So if you took an 18-year-old and you move them, you don't get any effect. If you take an 8-year-old, you know, that still has a chance to change the way they're going to behave, to change the, you know, whether they think they should be going to, to, to university, whether they should be studying hard in school, um, what they should be doing. All of that's influenced by their peers, their surrounding, their community. And, and you know, that ends up making a huge difference. Similarly, you know, uh, whether we have chances to do things is influenced by w which friends we have. Um, you know, whether we hear about a job opportunity, whether we hear about a certain university and, and uh, what it's like to pursue some sort of master's degree or graduate degree or even undergraduate degree. These things are all influenced by the people around us. And, and I think it's easy for us to just think that these things arrive and, and we have a full set of choices and, and full information, but a, a lot of it's fairly limited. And I think the, the one that's probably the most um, obvious and important is labor markets. And when you think about it, most people end up getting jobs um, through some sort of contact. It's, it's very rare, pretty much in any profession, to, for, for people to have an ability to get a job without knowing somebody um, who works at the company or, or you know, having some sort of contact. Um, being recommended by somebody to the company and so forth, at, even at, in terms of low-skilled labor, you know. So uh, I recently wrote a book and, and you know looked through and, and pretty much it, it's very difficult to find any profession where this isn't true. So Analyzing large-scale networks is very data intensive, but the data generating processes are rapidly evolving nowadays. Furthermore, network science could offer promising tools to understand causal inference within social sciences. Networks are hard to measure and hard to observe. Uh, it's very data intensive, so there's different ways to do it. I, I did one long-term study um, that I did with Abhijit Banerjee or in Chandra Sikhar and Estudu Flow. We, we went into a series of villages in India and literally went door to door 
and interviewed people and, and found out who they're interacting with, who they borrow money from, who they borrow kerosene from, who they get uh, advice from, who they get medical help from. And you know that's very labor intensive, so you can go and measure these things. Uh, nowadays, you have opportunities to get information from various media sources. You, you can look at emails, you can look at um, you know, people's uh, networks on LinkedIn or Facebook or um, WeChat, or you can track people's phones and, and who they're calling. So you can see interaction patterns and you can measure those on an individual basis, you can measure them on a larger basis. So it's possible to do this. It, it's, you know, it's just a very data intensive exercise. But I think you know, one of the reasons that you see network analysis sort of exploding in, in the social sciences in general is because this kind of, of data is much more available than it ever has been before. It's easier to collect, it's easier to find, um, it's easier to analyze. So, so there's, a, there's a big advantage to modern technology and, and making this easier to do. So this is research that, that can be done at a very granular level. Uh, but of course, this is all information that's technically owned by the companies. And that makes it much more difficult to access. And then there's some going to be some selection of what a company will allow you to publish. You know, right now we're still relying on the benevolence of companies and, and situations where it happens to be in their interest to allow things to be studied and to, to you know, to, to publish. And when we start talking about causation, um, networks are actually tricky to work with because, you know, if, if you look at my, say, uh, a, a group of high school students and you look at smoking behavior, and now you ask, okay, and you see a lot of correlation among people who are more likely to be friends with other people who smoke. Is it they smoke because their friends smoke or is it that they're friends with each other because they, they both smoke, right? And, and so that kind of endogeneity is really hard to get at. And, and it's very difficult to find settings where the network is somehow, you know it's completely exogenous and, and it's not you know, driven by the behaviors themselves. So causality in network settings is, is tricky. It's, it's not easy. Um, more generally, I think, uh, the way in which it helps understanding causation is there's a lot of settings where people normally would think that they had looked at all the variables that could have mattered, but they weren't taking into account the, the network structure. And you know, to the extent that now we're aware that, that the peers matter a lot, and you know, for instance, um, does somebody even participate in a, a program? You know, so suppose some government comes out and, and has a program where they're offering loans and only some of the people show up. Um, that could be very much due to the fact that they didn't, weren't aware of it or uh, the network structure mattered. And so understanding causation in that setting, we have to understand who showed up and why, and, and that's part of, you know, the network helps us understand that. So it can help enrich the understanding of, of a lot of things that matter in causal inference. It's common knowledge that free markets can provide win-win situations for its participants. However, trade networks also play a considerable role in diplomatic relations and military alliances. Let us find out how. I, I did a study with Stephen Nye where we looked at, at um, the structure of world trade and, and military and, uh, alliances and military conflict. And, and one thing that's, I think, fairly clear from the data, uh, again, causal inference is a little difficult, but the more countries trade, the more their interests are aligned um, and the less likely they are to have conflict, military conflict. If you look at the U.S.-China kind of conflict, um, when we think about you know, trade and what it can do for two countries, we're, right now they're fighting to split a pie, right? So, so the fight is really about who gets how much of the pie. And instead, it should really be about how big the pie should be, right? So, so these are situations where you can grow that pie and it could be larger for everybody. And instead, if you're, if you're worried, you know, you're fighting back and forth about how to split it, um, you end up not growing the pie at all. The personal journey one takes on can lead to many places before arriving at an office in the economics department at Stanford University. We have been inspired immensely by what we've heard from the professor. I always loved mathematics growing up and I loved science and um, I love, you know, I think of being an academic is being like a detective and you know you get to study questions and try and figure out the answers to them and it, it's just a lot of fun and it wasn't as if as at an early age I knew I wanted to do that it just I kept going through school and then I you know I didn't 
want that to stop. I enjoyed doing it and, and um, happened to make connections with certain professors who you know, helped me um, get research projects and helped me, um, uh, you know, mentors that, that uh, gave me an opportunity to see what it would be like. Um, I worked for, you know, during summers and so forth, I worked in warehouses, loading trucks. I worked in uh, um, a bank. Um, I worked in uh, financial industry. And, and by, by the chance, by the time I went through that, I had some idea that I, I, I didn't enjoy those jobs nearly as much as I enjoyed uh, really working with research and, and studying problems. Mm -hmm.